Good morning. How are you? I'm feeling eerily calm. Spring fling is going to start in like two and a half hours. And normally I'm like this. <laughs> so I have been praying an awful lot. And I have had lots of texts and emails over the last couple of days of people who can help and be a part of that. So please, please, please come on outside today and just enjoy yourselves and be a part of what's happening here at Broadus today. I still could use some folks to just plug in, be around the property, um, and just kind of enjoy what's going to happen here. If you are parked on this side, between here and the community building, in this parking lot area, I need for you to move. If you're going to stay for the event, I need for you to move and clear those spaces because we actually use those for games and food and things like that. So if you're staying, please just Scoot around the back and then come right on back in and we're going to get started setting up. Tia would like to come and tell us something else and then I think one of the missions committee people. There's a guy waving at me, but it's not the last guy I talked to, so we'll see. <laughs> Just hang in there. Be ready, guy number two. Good morning, church family. I would just like to extend a personal invitation to each one of you to join me on April the 29th, which is a Saturday, at 6 p.m. for the Virginia Baptist Women's Chorale Concert. Um, I do sing with the chorale. Former member Cindy Anderson also sings with the chorale. And we do about four concerts a year at different churches. We were scheduled for Broadus the April that COVID hit. And so this is our rescheduled concert. I am so happy to tell you that in all the years that I've been singing with the chorale, this is probably my favorite concert lineup. And we are doing a concert entitled The Life of Christ. And the lyrics of our songs follow Jesus from before his birth. So we'll, we'll be doing some Christmas songs. Um, not like you've heard before, but anyway. Um, we will also be doing the, the life and ministry of Jesus, his death and resurrection. And I think that you will be blessed if you come. We would love to see a full house. Um, if you have neighbors and friends that you would like to invite, it is free. Um, so please come and be blessed on Saturday the, 8th, the 29th at 6 o'clock. Thanks. Thank you, T. It looks like Neil's going to work his way this way. But um, I will mention a couple of other things. Easter missions offering is still being collected. You can put that in the Easter envelopes and drop them right in the regular um, receptacle that we have outside the door. Uh, the other thing I'll mention for you guys is um, May the 6th, the first Saturday of May, is a Moments of Hope feeding day. Um, and so that board is up, and you can sign up for those things. I'm going to invite Neil to come tell you something about missions you would think we had this organized or something wouldn't you anyway first of all i want to say thank you so much for the folks that donated to our yard sale it was a huge success it was amazing so over the course of the day people just kept carrying stuff out and the table stayed full because you guys were so generous and you're 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 collecting for other people and to support the community it was just a great event i want to give you a brief interim total um approximately $3,500 has already been raised. So that's an awesome statement on the love of Christ and, and what we're able to do for missions. If you uh, made a commitment to, to uh, pay us later, uh, we'll be glad to take a check, we'll be glad to take cash, whatever, but we'd like to close that out as soon as we can. If you, if you promise to pick up some stuff and you haven't, please do. If you promise to pay for stuff and you haven't, please do. Um, now, $3,500. That's a God number in my mind because I spoke with Stuart Martin yesterday afternoon. He is the, the gentleman that we've worked with as far as supporting the Ukraine ministry. Uh, we've done a lot of stuff. We're going to be on, we're going to be mentioned in a new story in Nashville where he's from by name because of what we've done to support them. But that's not what this is about. This is what this is about. One of the orphanages that he's working with, they have tried to construct you know, restroom, bathroom, shower facilities for all the children that are teaming in. And it keeps getting bombed. The, 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 it's been destroyed multiple times. They're not even trying again at that facility. They've got permission to move those children to another orphanage that's in, you know, safe zone is a relative term. But to move to a safer part of Ukraine, that facility 
once again, doesn't have restroom, bathroom, health facilities for them to, to expand and support that. Well, that facility is going to cost them $20,000. And Stewart's already committed to it. He's already promised. He's gotten um, one doctor in Atlanta, contributed about $15,000. He's already raised $2,000 more to complete that project is an additional $3,000. And what did we raise yesterday? $3,500. So thank you for that support. That, that's truly a God thing. I didn't even know that. I wouldn't have been able to, sh I, if I had shared it with you, it wouldn't have made a difference because you guys exceeded that. So bless you folks for that. Um, one other thing I wanted to share with you, please contact me if you have any interest or capability and going to help us um, May 13th, the Saturday before, camp, uh, before Mother's Day, with a trip to Camp Alkalana to do some preparation for summer camp. Anything you can do would be appreciated. If you want to do garden work, if you want to do cleanup work, housekeeping, if you got special skills like roofing or electrical, that's great too. They would use any help they can. Our plan is to meet here the Friday night before. Uh, we'll take the church van. If we have more people who fit in the church van, we'll carpool up. Uh, we'll eat dinner before we leave. We'll sleep in one of the lodges, and we'll hit the ground running Saturday morning, come back later, and we'll be here in time for church Sunday. Um, more details coming on that. More details coming on our Equal Irie um, multi-generational trip. But I just wanted to get that date on the calendar, May 13th, so we can really make an impact for Camp Alkalana. Thank you. Wow. Lots of God stuff happening. I got a couple more things for you. Um, our youth group's traveling this week. They're going to be camping, um, headed down to Durham, North Carolina to be doing some mission work. Um, and also have a praise this morning. We have split our children's Sunday school classes. We went from two to four in the last two weeks. And we didn't feel like either class was empty today. So yay, it's been great um, having everyone together. But it's also great to have so many people stepping up and plugging into the children's ministry. So I bless you, I thank you for what you are doing and I'm just watching God move amazingly today and I think that's why I'm eerily calm because I'm just letting him do it and not telling him what to do, which is something we should never do. So <laughs> let's go to the Lord in prayer and just ask his blessing on all the things that we're managing today, including this big event we've got coming up. Father, we just thank you so much for what you are doing here at Broadus and if we just stop and look and listen, it's amazing. It's God's stuff. And it just makes me excited. It also gets me very um, emotional because it's really amazing when you get to be in the middle of it and be part of being stirred with the big spoon about what it is that God wants to do here at Broadus. So I'm glad we got some voices from the congregation to come up here and talk about things that are going on, that are on their hearts, that they're involved in. There are so many ways that we can serve you, Lord. You are a big, giant God, and there's lots that needs to be done. So we need to get our, our really fast running shoes on, but not run ahead of you. I ask a special blessing on this spring fling. You've already blessed us mightily with lots of different things in the last few days, in the last few years. Um, I, I do remember the last time we were in our classroom for Sunday school, and, and, and like Tia said, it was three years ago that we were able to have Sunday school in our classroom. So I just thank you so much for that. And I thank you for everything that you're getting ready to do. Help us to keep our eyes open and to recognize when it happens and to jump on board and be a part of it. We pray all of this in your son's precious name. And they all said, amen. Amen. Good morning. I hope you're happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I'd love to invite you to stand at this time if you're able and sing with us. Our first song this morning is Confidence. qualified for what you call me to do but Lord with your strength I've got no excuse cause broken people are exactly who you use give me faith like Daniel in the lion's day give me hope like Moses in the wilderness give me a heart like 
can face my giants with confidence. You took a shepherd boy and made him a king. I'm going to trust you, Lord, and give you everything. I'll be a conqueror because you fight for me. I'll be a champion claiming your victory. Give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David, Lord, be my defense. So I can face my giants with confidence. I'm going to sing and shout and shout. I won't stop until I see him fall. I'm gonna stand up, step out when you call. Jesus, gonna sing and shout and shake the walls. Won't stop until I see him fall. I'm gonna stand up, step out when you call. Jesus, so give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. And give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David, Lord, be my defense. So I can face my giants with confidence. Give me faith like Daniel in the lion's day. Give me hope like Moses. Giants with Darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know Oh, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your Stand a chance when I stand in your 
seated. All right, I want to invite the children down. Just come meet me right in the, right in the front up here. Got something I want to show you this morning. All right, let me ask you a question. You guys like puzzles, All right? You like puzzles? Okay, you like hard puzzles or easy puzzles? Easy, hard, okay. All right, well, I'm going to show you a piece of a puzzle, okay? So this is kind of like a puzzle, but you don't have very many pieces on it yet. Can you see that? Okay. Sorry, we don't have it up on the screen. Can you all see that? Probably not. Okay. All right, you see, do you know what it is? Can you, can you guess what, it, what this puzzle is a puzzle of? You think of a moon? Oh, good guess. What's that? You think maybe animals or okay, so so dark, and you think maybe it's what? Maybe a man? A mammoth. Oh, okay. Well, we're we're gonna see because I I'm gonna show you a second picture. It's the same puzzle, but more of the pieces are in place, and you're gonna see how close this was. Oh, oh. So so, what do you think? Uh, Y'all think an elephant? Not, not quite a mammoth, but yes. Uh, all right. it looks, so y'all think it all looks like an elephant? Um, now, you think an elephant. Okay. But then there's a big blank place down here that doesn't have the pieces in. What, what do you think are down in that area? What's down in that area? Legs? Okay, of the elephant. You think more animals? Oh, okay. Well, look. Here's, here's another one, okay? And this one's all complete. <gasps> so, it, is there an elephant in this puzzle? Yes. But what else do you see besides the elephant? A horse or a donkey or something? Yes. Like a, oh, yeah, it could be a, a, oh, there's a mouse down there. What's right over the mouse? There's a cat. What's this over here? Like a monkey or a gorilla or something? Oh, it's an ape because it didn't have a tail. Boy, the kids are going to school these days. I didn't know that. So, all right. So it was easier once all the pieces got into the puzzle, right? So you could see everything. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, be, be talking today about a story from the Gospel of Luke about a couple of people who loved Jesus and they had to figure things out just a little bit at a time. They didn't really understand all about Jesus at the beginning. And they weren't from his 12 disciples, okay? But these were other people who loved Jesus and they had seen Jesus heal people. And they had heard Jesus preach, and they knew that Jesus was loving and kind. So they understood that about Jesus, but they didn't yet understand all about Jesus. But then they also saw when Jesus died on the cross. And so they knew that he loved them enough to die on the cross, but they still didn't know all about him. Well, then Easter Sunday came, and what happened on Easter Sunday? Jesus did what? Rose from the grave, right. But they hadn't seen him yet, okay? And some of the women talked to an angel or some angels who said, Oh, Jesus has risen. He's not in the grave anymore. And the, the women told these other, uh, these other followers of Jesus about it. But they hadn't seen Jesus themselves, so they still weren't sure. They were learning more and more. Well, the story is then these two disciples, these two followers of Jesus, they were taking a trip down a dusty road together, going to a neighboring town called Emmaus. And all of a sudden, while they're walking along talking about all these strange things that Jesus died on the cross, but now some people say he's alive and all of this, they're talking about it, and Jesus pops up, and starts walking with them. 
And you would think that they would have gone, oh, Jesus, and gave him a big hug. But they didn't because it says they didn't, they didn't recognize him yet. They didn't know who he was. And so then Jesus talked to them about the things that the Old Testament taught about how he was going to give his life, but then you know, live again and, and live forever. And he taught them all this stuff. Then they even went into a house and were having dinner together. And Jesus took bread and he, yes, he broke the bread. And then they realized this is Jesus. And they were so excited about it because all of a sudden, all the pieces of the puzzle made sense. That they realized, oh, these things that the, that the Bible said long ago actually came true. When Jesus died on the cross and then rose from the grave. And all of a sudden they got to see him themselves. And they ran to tell the other, uh, the other believers as well. And so I just wanted you to know that sometimes God works a little bit at a time. He teaches you a little bit. Um, you know, he taught me a little bit when I was young, but as I got a little older, as I got up to be a youth, he taught me a little bit more when I got up to be a young adult, and he's still teaching me today. And so just be thankful that, that God has given you a big picture, that you would know him, that you would understand how much he loves you and what he's done uh, for the world and sending Jesus into the world, and that we can just appreciate a God who makes himself known to us. So let's pray together, okay? Heavenly Father, we're not smart enough to understand everything. We study the Bible, but we don't understand everything that we read. But what we do know is that you are real. We know that you love us. We know that you sent your son, Jesus, into the world, that he died for us, and he rose again, and he is our, our living an eternal Lord. And so we thank you for this wonderful news because it changes our life because through Jesus, you offer us eternal life. Thank you for giving us that big picture. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thanks for coming up with me. You can go back with your families. Good morning. Good morning. I'll be reading from Psalm 103 today. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who he redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you as angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, so, we, so you as servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, my soul. remain seated but uh, if you know this one we would love for you to sing along this um, this is one of my favorites several years ago um, I learned it on guitar and um, this was back in the days where I didn't I didn't have anybody to help me lead worship except this young guy named Ryan a fantastic guitar player um, he ended up moving to Nashville and but I was sitting there and I was trying to learn this song and up until this point everything that I had done was in 4-4 and trying to, <laughs> trying to play and sing at the same time. So this one is in 3 and I'm sitting there and I'm playing it and I think, I said, All right, Ryan, I think I got it. And he just, you know, very calmly looked and he said, you don't. It's, um. <laughs> he said, it's, you're, you're not there yet, but keep trying. So I wish he could hear it this morning. <laughs>
tongue hung Oh, let the ancient words impart Words of life and words of hope Give us strength, help us grow In this world This will uh, date me a little bit, but I believe my first experience on a church staff, kind of in a church setting, was at Parkview Baptist Church, Richmond, Virginia. Some of you know Parkview. Ted down here certainly does. Uh, it's not Parkview anymore. But I was their summer youth minister back in 1984. Maybe it was 85, but it, right in that, that area. And uh, it was kind of between semesters of, of, of college. And, and one thing I, I remember from that, uh, from that Sunday was the day that uh, Pastor Stevens got up and he was uh, talking about an event that had taken place at the church. So he said the day came and he, he either got the call, I can't remember if he's in the church building or got the call to come. Well, five fire trucks were surrounding the church building. Because somebody in the community thought that they had seen smoke coming out from the, uh, uh, from the roof or from a window or something, and they had called 911. Well, of course, after checking it out, it actually was, was not a fire. There was no problem in the building. But one of the things that Pastor Stevens said was, folks, I just want you to know that at least for a moment, somebody in our community thought this church was on fire. Well, we know by experience that fire can be a good thing or a, a bad thing. You can cook a delicious steak on a fire or you can burn down your house with it. And there's certainly a, a dramatic difference between a church fire and a church that is on fire, talking about on fire for the Lord. 
In the same way, there's a difference between heartburn and a burning in your heart. I want to share with you today about an occasion in the Gospels when two followers of Jesus, what I already introduced to the children, two followers of Jesus talked about their hearts burning within them. Now, an alternate title for this sermon could be Holy Heartburn. I want us to consider what it means to have a spiritual fire within us, a fervor and enthusiasm for the things of the Lord. Now, you may have some experience with being on fire for the Lord. I hope you know what I'm talking about. This fire within, when the work of the Holy Spirit is growing in your heart and in your mind, and it, it tends to give a Christian a, a radiance, a, a glow. You know, expectant mothers, as they're beginning to, to show, they're often described not as being fat, but as glowing. Why does that term fit? Well, it has to do with a life growing within them. This fire in, in your heart, in the heart of a believer, is something that's felt on the inside, and yet somehow it's also visible on the outside. This inner fervor is often easy to detect in somebody who has just recently become a Christian. The forgiveness, the transformation, the indwelling spirit, the hope, the promises that, that come to us from God, they're all so new to this new believer that they are always excited. It overwhelms them. It's kind of exciting to witness that in a person. <clears throat> but then our experience also tells us that holy heartburn is not necessarily a consistent thing. The flames of faith do seem to flicker sometimes, don't they? Not that you lose or abandon your faith, but it doesn't always seem to burn quite as bright. It doesn't always feel the same. Now, why is that? It can be for a lot of different reasons. One, this world can be hard. Sometimes the challenges of life, they, they, they wear us down. The struggles we face wear us out. We become discouraged and disillusioned. And even if those feelings are not aimed towards God in a negative way, they can still affect us spiritually. According to Jesus, in one of his parables... The weeds of the world are pretty good at strangling out the, the, uh, the healthy stalks of wheat or the, the healthy things and faith in our lives. Or we might lose that spark, that burning within, because we've simply starved ourselves spiritually. Too seldom do we partake of the living water and the, the bread of life, and so the flame flickers because of neglect. And then sometimes you just can't define it. Sometimes it, it just happens. Maybe we become burned out, working too hard, trying too hard. Or maybe there's just a natural cycle to our emotions that's not fatal as long as it's identified. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, the Apostle Paul talks to his young protege, Timothy, and he says, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you. You know what it means to fan into flame, to, to blow a little oxygen there so that, that something burns brighter. Even Timothy, who was such a, a great young leader in the New Testament church, he needed to hear that. He needed to be reminded of that from time to time. And the good news is that our passion for God and our Christian radiance can indeed be fanned into flame, resulting in this, this holy heartburn, this burning within that no Pepto-Bismol or Zantac or anything like that, nothing's going to put it out. So with that in mind, let me invite you to a part of the Easter story that we very often skip over. Uh, it involves these two disciples, these two followers of Jesus 
who in all likelihood were not among the twelve, but among others who had put their, their hope and their faith in Christ. After the crucifixion, their faith was understandably shaken. They had not come to a realization of how horrible it was going to be to lose Jesus. And even the twelve disciples were discouraged. And so even after the faithful women brought the message of the resurrection from the angels at the tomb, it was hard for them to wrap their heads around that or wrap their hearts around it maybe. They seemed to be in a spiritual limbo. So even though a message from Jesus had already been shared with them to go and to wait for him up in Galilee, these two instead for some reason took a different route. They were going on the road to the west instead of the road north to the town of Emmaus. So let's listen with discerning hearts to learn something that might help us to regain or maintain the spiritual fervor and radiance inside us. So we're going to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, I'm going to start at verse 13. And so just remember, this would be happening on what we would tend to call uh, you know, Easter afternoon, I guess. It says, now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that, uh, that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. And he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find the body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Did you catch verse 32? They asked each other, it says, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Somehow after this encounter, they were different. They felt different. They acted different. 
So what brought about this transformation in their hearts and their lives? Well, the rekindling of spiritual fervor happened by the spending time in the presence of the living Lord. Now, many years ago, I, I read a story about a missionary who traveled to a very remote village in, in South America. And it wasn't long before a crowd gathered around this strange man, and they were, they were happy to hear what he had to say, happy to, to hear him preach. And of course, in the simple, simplest language that he could use, he preached the story of Jesus and nobody really gave any indication that they knew who he was talking about. But when the missionary spoke about the crucifixion and the burial of Jesus, several of the village uh, elders said, Oh, oh, now we, now we know who you're talking about. We have him here with us. And the missionary asked what they meant by that. So they led him to an old neglected shack on the edge of the town. And inside the shack was a coffin in which laid a carving of the crucified Christ. No doubt brought by a missionary many generations before. This is our Jesus, they said. And then the missionary realized that all they knew about Jesus was that he had died. And then he happily shared with them about the resurrection, knowing that only a living Savior could offer them the hope that they so badly needed. Well, the disciples on the road to Emmaus had a certainty of Jesus' love. They had a certainty of his sacrifice. They had seen him die on the cross. But what they didn't yet have a certainty about was his victory that he could actually be alive again. True hope and joy would only come when they knew that Jesus was living. And the passage tells us that at first they did not recognize Jesus even as he walked and talked with them. Verse 16 says they were kept from recognizing him. I don't know exactly what that means. It could mean that Jesus looked different than he did before. Or that their sorrow and their, their doubt clouded their, their vision, not necessarily physically, but just their spiritual understanding. Or it could mean that God was hiding the truth from them until the best moment of revelation. However it was, all they knew for sure was that a stranger had joined them on their walk and had joined into their discussion. And he seemed to be strangely ignorant about all that had happened uh, in the past few days to this young prophet, Jesus of Nazareth. But it wasn't long before they recognized something special and something unusual about him. At first he seemed ignorant, but then he seemed to have an extraordinary understanding of Scripture. He was able to share truth to those who were doubting, and to give hope to the hopeless. He understood who the prophesied Messiah was going to be. And they invited him not just to continue walking with them and talking with them, but then also to stay with them when they got to Emmaus and to, to share a, a meal with them. And it was during this time that their hearts began to burn within them. It had everything to do with spending time in the presence of the living Lord. Many people claim to have faith, but it's dull and stagnant at best. They say they believe Jesus is alive and victorious, but they don't act like it. They claim He is their personal Lord and Savior, but there's no intimacy or closeness in the relationship. They don't spend time talking to Him in prayer and listening for what we call His still, small voice. They face decisions, and yet they don't ask Him for His wisdom. They face sorrows without seeking His comfort. 
They face despair without opening their hearts to his encouragement. They try to battle temptations without going to Jesus and asking him for his strength. They acknowledge that Jesus is always present, but they never open their spiritual eyes to actually see what he's doing in the world around them and in their own lives. And therefore, they rarely express their gratitude to him. And without gratitude, they never experience the joy of his indwelling spirit. There's nothing personal about a relationship that doesn't have communication. If ritual is all you want out of religion, then you don't need a living Savior. But you will also never know the all-encompassing experience of the growing flame of faith in your heart. You will never have that knowledge and assurance of a salvation that a living Savior can offer. And so allow Christ, allow the living Christ to be part of your daily life. Acknowledge Him that he is with you, that he, he cares about you, that he is trying to teach you. Listen to him. Talk to him. Allow him to shape you. But then we also find that this spiritual fire grows as we study the scripture for inspiration and for understanding. Have you ever wondered that if we had Jesus with us today physically as he was there in the, the first century, would we even need the Bible? I think the answer would be yes. Because in his earthly ministry, Jesus constantly called upon Scripture for himself and he used it to teach his followers. So did you notice that when Jesus was trying to rekindle their faith, of these two disciples on the road, he did it by turning their thoughts back to the holy writings. Luke 24, 27 says this, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And then they later acknowledge how their hearts burned within them as he did this. Their spiritual vitality grew as they grasped how the Old Testament writings pointed to the saving work of what we call the New Testament Messiah. Now, there is no magic in a book, not in the written words upon a page, but there is life-changing power in God's message to His people. So the Bible can't save you. Got that? We don't worship the Bible. That would be called bibliolatry, and it's wrong. But it can lead you to the one who can save you. The Apostle John wrote this toward the end of his gospel. He was, he was saying that not everything that Jesus said and did got recorded, but he said, and this is John 20, verse 31, he said, but these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's the purpose of the scripture. It's there to help us come to belief, to faith. The book of Hebrews speaks of the, the difference God's message can make in our hearts when it says this in Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the, the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. This is saying that, that the message that God gives us is pertinent to us. It has the, the, the power to change things and to, to speak to the deepest parts of our lives. And then the Apostle Paul wrote <coughs> that God inspired Scripture to help teach us, to rebuke us, to correct us, to train us, 
so that we could be the kind of people that God wants and so that we could do the things that God wants us to do. So yes, if the flames of faith are dim in your heart, if your enthusiasm for the things of the Lord is low, you can find both understanding and inspiration by studying your Bible. But remember, it will be meaningless unless you apply the truths that God reveals to you. You need to let it make a difference in your daily living. You will then gain an excitement when you put your growing faith to work. Which leads to another truth I want you to, <clears throat> to see in the passage. Sharing with others the truths that Christ has revealed to us, just doing that fans the flame of spiritual fervor. The two disciples felt such enrichment being in the presence of Jesus and hearing him teach from the, from the Holy Scriptures. It was so wonderful, they didn't want the time to end. That's why they said, why don't you just stay with us for the night? When they got to Emmaus, they, they begged him to stay the evening. Um, and even though uh, we have no reason to believe that these two had been in the upper room with the twelve a few days earlier, it was in giving thanks and breaking bread together. When Jesus prayed to the Father, all of a sudden they recognized him. And Jesus, knowing their faith was solid, and that their lives were forever changed, he disappeared from their midst. God needed him somewhere else even more. Now, there are certainly lessons that we could pull from this, this breaking of the bread. But instead, I want you to notice what they did next. As their hearts were burning within them, they knew that they had to share about their encounter with Jesus with someone. And back in Jerusalem were a lot of disciples who were just like they had been. Still s sad, still bewildered, burned out by all that had been happening. So immediately they hit the road back to Jerusalem. I imagine they were going even in the dark. I imagine they were jogging this time instead of walking. And so soon... They got back to where their friends were, and they told him the story of, of Jesus on the road and how Jesus himself appeared to them. But it's interesting that Jesus usually lets people bear witness um, first before other people come to faith. And so he sent these two on this, this mission. They knew this is what they, they had to do. And even though the disciples were, were, were hearing about Jesus being alive, already having two others come and to share their testimony made a big difference. And I want you to know that Jesus usually becomes real to people after they have heard the testimony of believers. And so, folks, that's part of our calling. The lesson is that to keep the spiritual flame in our hearts burning, we need to act on it. We need to share the message. Your faith won't go dormant if you remain active in sharing about Jesus. You've probably heard that most species of sharks stay constantly moving. They, they don't sleep like, like we do. They kind of continually swim and they they lack uh what's called a swim bladder for buoyancy and they also these sharks don't have an internal mechanism for pumping oxygen rich water through their gills so they keep on the move now instead of tiring them out always being on the move they actually get more vitality because the oxygen is feeding their blood. Now, we are different. We do need downtime. We do need sleep. But the lesson is that the more active we are for the Lord, the more our spiritual vitality stays 
right. We see this in the light of Jesus, in, in the life of Jesus. Whenever Jesus withdrew from the crowds and went off by himself, he went to, to pray and, and I'm sure had some personal recuperation time, but then always he hopped right back into the ministry. The purpose of taking a, taking a moment uh, alone with the Father was so that he could get back to his ministry among the people. And so if you're truly a believer, you have a story to tell and you have a ministry to perform. You are a witness about what Christ is doing in your life. You should be sharing it with others in order to encourage them. And sharing it with those who have, have never come to faith in order to draw them to Jesus. Being an active witness will keep the fire in your heart alive. Maybe you're here this morning and you're simply feeling burned out. Kind of like those disciples were. Maybe life has been hard. Don't feel guilty about it. But know that there is something you can do about it. Put time in your day to pray and to acknowledge the presence of Christ. Spend time in Bible study both alone by yourself and with other Christians. As you listen to Christian music, listen to the, the scripture-based words. Let them feed your heart. And God can use this to revitalize your spiritual strength. And then share your faith. It may seem awkward at first, but do it until it becomes the most natural thing in the world. And I would add to that the importance of listening to other people's stories, other people's experiences of faith. Learn what God is doing in other people's lives, other Christians' lives right around you, and even what is God doing around the world. And then partner with your brothers and sisters in Christ in being part of God's work. Spiritual doldrums are not unusual. And they are not fatal. But they are also not meant to be permanent. God gives you the means to renew your passion. Open your heart to the work of His Spirit. And as the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 12, he said, never be lacking in zeal. But keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. If we commit to this together, maybe one day the community around us will say, that church is on fire. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for being patient with us, understanding of us, that we go through ups and downs in life. Sometimes our faith is challenged. Sometimes we, we too long focus on our doubts. But you give us the means by which to rekindle our faith. That we can go to Christ. That we can receive his guidance in, in our hearts through the, uh, the ministry of your spirit. I thank you, Lord, that we have Bibles that we can read both about the Old Testament times, but even more importantly, about the New Testament of what you have done through your Son, Jesus Christ. And then, Lord, be with us as through, when through example and, and sharing verbally, we find ways to, to share this message with others. So, Lord, light the fire within us. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to close our service today with hymn number 334. If you like to use the, the red hymn books that are there in the chair pockets, you certainly may. And this is Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Many of you know these words by heart. And as we sing together, if the Lord lays a decision on your heart that you want to share publicly, I'll be here at the front. I welcome you to come down and speak with me. Stand with me as we sing. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit. Washed in his blood, this 
is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Angels descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. my Savior all the day long. Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. Help us throughout this week to see others through your eyes and to share that fire. Be with us, Lord. Bring us back safely next week in Jesus' name. And we all say, Amen. Amen. Grace have a have a place for you to stay, or y'all. Uh, we're staying with her, and then um, we're going to like several different places in France. Like England, Airbnb. Airbnb. Stuff, yeah. 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 She's okay. got it all planned. Oh, she cool. She took off like a couple weeks. So. Oh, neat. Yeah, yeah. Well, send our love. Thanks. Have a good time. <laughs> You're not my way, Roy. Wow, y'all are quick. We are ready to roll. Ready to roll. Let's get busy. <laughs> oh man, we got the train out. That's yeah. Yeah. You too. <laughs> <laughs>